Hello. Welcome back <clears throat> to flyingcloudzen.org's YouTube channel in this loosely connected series of talk offerings that I post from time to time. Uh, I'm glad you're here. I hope it's a benefit to you to think about spiritual practice, your own life as spiritual life, Dharma, in particular, mindfulness and Buddhism, and the degree to which that can help you have insight into your own experiences being a human being for a few years. This fleeting and temporary thing we call life. I don't know if it matters. Um, just a short, just a short offering today. Um, I want to talk about uh, the spiritual practice of making a list of things that you are avoiding. This is something that um, I've been encouraged to do a number of different times in my life from a number of different teachers and in a number of different settings. Um, perhaps the simplest way um, of introducing yourself to this exercise is to take a minute um, and just pull out a piece of paper <clears throat> or open up a document and write down three things that you are aware that you are avoiding. Three makes it a little more manageable than 10. I'm sure we're all avoiding at least 10, if not 100, but let's just keep it simple. Let's do the exercise of writing down three things that we know that we are avoiding. Um, when I say avoiding, I mean avoiding thinking about, avoiding talking about, avoiding feeling, uh, avoiding doing, Three things I'm ad I'm avoiding uh, admitting to or relating to. That, pa that last one is especially important because that's really what they're all about. There are parts of our everyday life <clears throat> that we uh, instinctually avoid relating to. And when I say instinctually, I don't just mean habit. I mean literally instinctually right our humanity our our uh, the animal part of our humanity in particular uh, the mammal part of our wiring as humans right we're warm-blooded mammals two-leggeds out there running around that part of us that mammalian physical sensibility is hardwired instinctually to avoid that which hurts of course Right? It's part of our survival function. We can certainly understand why we all do that. We get to forgive ourselves for instinctually doing that. We get to forgive each other for instinctually doing that. It is part of the hardwiring of our bodies. I will avoid that which hurts, that which I remember hurting me, that which I fear in the future could hurt me. This is part of our deal. So, when we start noticing, oh, I'm start, I'm actually avoiding talking about fill in the blank with uh, my neighbor. I'm avoiding filling in uh, fill in the blank. I'm avoiding talking about uh, with my spouse, with my coworkers, with my student, with my teacher, with my uh, children, with my parents. I'm avoiding having the experience of. This comes up a lot for us. So I do encourage you, make a list. Make a list. See if you can pull into your conscious awareness things that you are unconsciously, in other words, without awareness, unconsciously avoiding all the time. Rooms in your house. I'm avoiding those boxes in the attic. I am avoiding having that conversation with my neighbor about how their dog keeps coming onto my yard. I am avoiding having that conversation with my spouse about how much money we spend on presents, or whose turn it is to do the dishes, or do we agree or don't agree that our kid should get more money for college or less? Whatever that looks like. I'm avoiding, I notice, having the experience of talking to my uh, folks about end of life directives, even though it's time, I know that it's time. I don't wanna have that conversation. Why is this a powerful spiritual practice? Why has it been offered to me so many times over the years? Why am I now 
offering it to you. Um, it helps us to acknowledge, I hope, befriend, I hope even forgive this baseline avoidance that we all inherit as part of our human bodies. Just to know, even if I continue the behavior of avoiding, I now am consciously aware of the fact that I am avoiding. I know that I am avoiding that consciously aware of it. I wrote it down on a piece of paper. I wrote it down. I know that that is happening. Because that can be step one toward beginning to actually have a relationship with the experience that I imagine that I'm avoiding. So what we're likely to say is, I don't want to have that conversation um, with my neighbor about their dog wandering into my yard because I'm afraid that they're going to get upset. I'm afraid there'll be a conflict. I'm afraid I'll be misunderstood. I'm afraid that it'll make things worse. I'm afraid, I'm afraid, whatever, you know, whatever form that takes, whatever form that narrative takes for you. And underneath that, what's helpful to recognize is what I'm avoiding is I'm avoiding having the feeling that I imagine I will have. That's actually what's happening. The story makes it sound like I'm afraid of their reaction. I'm afraid of this part of my neighbor's personality. I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. We usually list the external things, right? The things that might happen, the things that might get said, the things that might get done, right? Because the feeling that will show up in our hearts when those things happen, that's where the fear actually lies. That's where the fear actually lies. I'm really scared of asking, hey, what did you think of my, what did you think of the painting that I spent that whole week on? I spent a whole week creating that beautiful painting. What do you think of it? I'm scared of asking feedback on that. Why? Oh, I'm afraid they're going to say they don't like it. Somebody not liking something that I created isn't an experience to be feared. There's actually not fear there, if I'm honest. But if I look more deeply, it's because if you say, I don't like your painting, I am liable to feel shame, Ugh. embarrassment. Ugh. So that shows me there's a feeling in me that I do not want to have a relationship with. I do not want to have a relationship with embarrassment. I don't want to feel bad. I don't want to feel ashamed. And if that person says, I don't like your painting, I thought it was stupid, I thought it was derivative, I thought it was simplistic, whatever they would say. What's going to get activated in me is a whole bunch of mechanisms, really old habits, habits of mind. They don't like your painting, that means something about you, that means you're a bad painter. Bad painter means you're a bad person, bad person means nobody likes you, nobody cares, you should be ashamed. Ugh. Do you feel it? How quickly that cascade happens. It happens in literally a matter of seconds or seconds, very, very, very quickly. So it makes sense that we miss what we're actually scared of, and we just go to, I'm scared that they're going to say they don't like it. I'm scared that the neighbor's going to say, he's going to let his dog roam wherever the heck it wants to. I'm scared of, I'm scared of, I'm scared of. But the truth is, we're skipping the bit that we're actually fearing. I, I'm scared of having the experience of sadness, confusion, anger, despair, hopelessness, embarrassment, shame. Right? That makes sense. When we actually can see this, we just go, oh, I get it. It makes sense. I would, I would fear having that experience because that's an unpleasant experience, and I am hardwired to avoid having an unpleasant experience. If I don't ask you what you think of my new painting, if I don't say, hey, your dog is coming onto my lawn, if I don't do that, then I can't have that thing happen that I'm scared of. But can you feel that I'm when I obey that fear, I am living in separation from myself. Of course, I'm literally living in separation to the other person, too. I'm not having that conversation. There's no possibility of anything changing. There's certainly no possibility of connecting or understanding because I'm living in this distance. But the truth is, this outside form it's going to take, I won't ask the neighbor to curb his dog. I won't ask you what you think of my painting. I won't tell my parents, it's time to sit down and talk about end-of-life directives because that's going to happen. You're going to die and we need to talk about who's going to take care of you and what that's going to look like. 
The truth is, the primary experience that I'm trying to avoid is the experience here. The fear that I will, f that I will feel, the anxiety that I'm going to feel during those conversations, the possibility of feeling angry, hurt, misunderstood, left behind, abandoned, ashamed. You can fill in the blanks here because you know your own heart. That's why we avoid. We avoid because there's going to be an emotion. There's going to be a feeling, and we don't want to have that feeling. So the reason this exercise, this simple exercise, write down three things you're avoiding, is you get to open up the door to the relationship with that thing in yourself, all by yourself. Whether you do go on to choose to have the conversation with the parents or the neighbor or ask the opinion about the painting becomes secondary. Because if we actually spend the time within our own mind, within our own heart, you can feel where I'm, you can see where I'm touching when I say mind, I'm pointing to my chest, right? When we do this work inside of us and go, oh, I can see what's happening there. We can start to see where the suffering actually comes from. That's what I'm actually scared of. I'm scared of the mechanism in me getting active. That's where the fear is. Because the truth is, when I have done that work and I realize your opinion of my painting, your opinion of my talk, that can't cause a feeling in me. It's impossible. That can't cause a feeling in me. I loved it. I thought it was great. Hated it. Boring and stupid. Okay. That's your experience. That's perfectly fine. Those are thoughts you have. That's also perfectly fine. The degree to which I go, ah, that's about me. That is about me, that is my reactivity to your opinion. And it's, if we're really honest, it's based on an idea that I have that isn't true. A fundamentally caustic, a fundamentally toxic misunderstanding of what's actually happening. I didn't like your talk, I didn't like your painting. I'm gonna let my dog roam. I don't wanna have a conversation with you about whether or not we're gonna die and who's gonna take care of those decisions. I don't wanna do it, ah, right? The scenario that I most fear when that comes to pass the degree to which I am going to experience suffering is the degree to which that dynamic is already alive in me. If you say you don't like my talk, you don't like my painting, and I collapse into, oh, I must already have a narrative in me that very, very deeply believes if people don't like you or they think ill of something that you created, that means you're bad. That's a true thing. There's my sucker. If I see it for what it is, oh, you didn't appreciate the talk. You didn't like the painting. You don't want to have the conversation about end of life. Okay. Okay. Maybe there's something else to be done there. Maybe not. But you can see it for what it is. And any suffering that arises in this very human heart can be addressed by this very human heart. I have places within me that don't suffer and places within me that can then attend to the part of me that is suffering, just like you do. You have places and you have great compassion, great understanding, great wisdom, we all do. It's the nature of mind. And so when our suffering shows up, <gasps> those constricted places, those fear reactions, uh, those resistances to the emotion, we can go, oh, I see what's happening. I understand. I understand why you're scared to ask, because you imagine if they don't like your painting, that's gonna mean you're bad. I need to tell you that that fear makes sense. I can feel that with you. That's fine. And also, it's not true. Like it's really, really, actually, truly, literally not true. Everybody in the entire world could agree your painting is horrible. <laughs> that still means absolutely nothing about you. Not one thing. Nothing. Poof. Suffering isn't created. Because you see clearly. You just see, oh, I get it. I saw the mechanism within me, and now I see it. And I can sit with my fear. It's not a problem. We call that compassion. I can correct the falsehood. Oh, wait, that doesn't actually mean anything about me. Boom. We call that wisdom, compassion, wisdom. The functioning of Buddha consciousness in human form. The Buddha part of us relating to the human part of us going, I get it. You're wired to be scared and anxious. I understand. That makes sense. I can feel that with you. But 
I can also set a limit with that. I can correct it. It's not true. You can go ahead and have the conversation that you're scared of having because you're willing to be with the feeling that might get created when it happens. So then there, therefore no problem, no obstacle. Talk to the neighbor. Ask your friend's opinion about your painting. Go talk to your folks, whatever that looks like. It's fine. You know it's fine because you're not depending on the other person's response to be a certain way or to not be a certain way. You can handle it. It's fine. You've already related to it within yourself. Hi, fear. Hi, anxiety. Hi, shame. I understand. I get why you're here. It's fine. I'm big enough to hold you. I understand what's going on here. I understand that that person's reaction or not reaction or words or no words or whatever, they're just an activator. It's fine. The actual drama is happening here. And I'm, I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. I'm holding it. It's fine. I'm correcting the thing that's hurting me. It's false. That's okay. I got it. I hope this makes sense. I hope this makes sense. I'm offering it because I've been told to do this so many times in lots of different ways. In lots of different ways. I saw this in recovery programs. I've seen this in Christian settings. I've seen this in Buddhist settings. I've seen it in therapeutic settings, relational settings, like, hey, you and your spouse or you and your new romantic partner, you and your parents, you and your kids, there's a whole bunch of conversations you are not having because you are humans. That is a normal thing. There's a whole bunch of stuff you're not wanting to look at. And from a Buddhist point of view, all that means is that's where I imagine suffering lies. And so there's where my practice should go. There's where my work should go. That's what Buddhism's about. Hey, I see that there's suffering. Let me move toward it. Let me hold it. Let me be in relationship with it. That's all. I see where there's suffering. I will go toward it. That's the Buddhist response to suffering. <gasps> it hurts. Let's go toward it. Let's hold it. Let's pick it up. Let's accept it. Allow it. Understand it. Investigate, be curious, be kind. How else can we possibly dismantle the structures of suffering if we don't move toward them, if we don't accept them, if we don't understand them? That's all you're doing internally with this exercise that I'm offering to you. Write down some stuff you're avoiding and then spend some time within yourself just going, hey, what's that about? I wonder what that's actually about. Do you feel how that diffuses it? It makes the big giant thing actually not so big. And you may or you may not actually take an, odd, um, an action in the world. You may or may not actually um, instigate a conversation. Maybe. But the inner work you do, that will transform your entire relationship with it. So I encourage it. Please, make a list. <laughs> Three things you're avoiding. And just spend a little bit of time with it. That is good spiritual practice. It's an act of great kindness toward yourself. All right. And then let me know. Let me know how it works. Offer something in the chat or the, uh, what do you call it, comments. Put something in the comments below or drop me an email. I'm always happy to hear about um, what your experience with practices. That way I can help to be as of much support as I possibly can. We're in it together, right? All right. Thanks for your attention today. I hope this is helpful to you. Um, come back again soon. Okay. Bye-bye.